In 2015, Iowan Tiyashioto was seeking asylum for his family as a refugee, claiming that the rising sea was threatening their lives and home in the Pacific Island nation of Kiribati. Iowan was attempting to be recognized as the world's first climate refugee. A climate refugee is a popular term being used in the media to describe people displaced by disasters associated with climate change. The 1951 Refugee Convention does not recognize environmental factors as criteria to define a refugee. A refugee, according to the convention, is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. For this reason, New Zealand was able to deny Iowans' family asylum. They were deported for overstaying their visa after the courts ruled that even though Iowans' house may be uninhabitable, other places on the island still are. The courts claimed there was still adequate time for Kiribati to adapt and mitigate the effects of sea level rise. Think about this for a second. Knowing what we know about how industrialized countries have contributed more to climate change, is it fair that the responsibility lies with Kiribati to make their islands habitable? One of the reasons that international institutions don't want to introduce the term climate refugees is because of the challenge that would come with proving that certain situations are the result of climate change. Can you imagine trying to prove that a flood or fire wasn't normal for this region, but was instead made worse by climate change? It would be a difficult thing for refugees to prove! Unfortunately, Iowan didn't have sufficient evidence for the committee to rule in his favor, but there is hope for future climate refugees seeking asylum. The status of climate refugees is something that is still being debated today. It was only in 2018 that the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Global Compact on Refugees, recognizing that climate, environmental degradation, and natural disasters increasingly interact with the drivers of refugee movements. In general, drivers of migration include economic factors, demographic factors, and environmental factors, as well as social and political dynamics. Throughout the rest of this video, we will be hearing from Kristen Hogue, a cultural studies PhD student at UC Davis. Her work focuses primarily on how climate change and migration are going to impact the cultures of people living in Oceania. We do know that the next 10 to 15 years on our planet are going to be um, extreme from a migration perspective. Migration is actually like a, a cascade of processes. These processes of climate migration, they're going to affect the most marginalized communities. For example, you know, vector-borne diseases are on the rise in areas where temperatures are on the rise. We need to look at it from this aspect because we're, we're potentially moving into an era of increased you know, geopolitical instability. When you have a whole um, area that is out migrating into an area that is receiving this in migration, you're going to have a clash of you know, traditions and lifestyles and uh, of cultures basically. In 2018, the World Bank estimated that three regions, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia, will generate 143 million more climate refugees by 2050. Given all of this, it's easy to see why the CNA Military Advisory Board released a report in 2014 that identified climate change as a threat multiplier. Climate change causes more drought, more famine, more mass displacement, which fuels more conflict as cultures clash and fight for resources. It multiplies existing threats, adding fuel to the fire. Are you starting to get an idea of the scope of this issue? Even if climate change is not directly affecting you and your day-to-day -day life now, with all the conflict and migration occurring, it's easy to see how this really is a global issue that will affect everyone. Only some people are being displaced, and the countries and regions that aren't as affected the ones who have contributed the most to climate change also tend to have the resources in order to adapt to the consequences. They can use new technologies and infrastructure to keep the regions habitable. But what about those they're leaving behind? We need to transition in a way that claims accountability. We need a just transition. In the climate movement, we call it a just transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, um, one that centers and um, uplifts uh, you know, minorities and communities of color, they don't have the resources, they don't have the, the money to, to, to fight climate change. And we have this, this global process of othering where, you know, they're different, they're, they're, they're the other. And you can see that playing out at, you know, at the southern border of the United States. We're going to have to adapt to the differences between us and somehow reframe those differences in a way that allows you know, each culture. What Kristen said is true. 
There is a global culture of othering, and we need to find a way to become more tolerant of our differences so that cultures can coexist as the climate continues to change. Thank you for tuning into this episode on climate refugees and migration. My name is Greta. Be sure to like and subscribe to Planet Tiendo. You won't want to miss out on the rest of the series. We'd like to thank the Green Initiative Fund for contributing to this project.